So my name is Jason Perkins, and I wanted to talk to you today about uh, hard drives in vintage systems, uh, AKA, what's that horrible grinding noise and where has my data gone? So fix this storage obviously goes back quite a ways. And what I wanted to focus on today is kind of this, this middle area in kind of early home computers and then kind of almost going into the 1990s in home computers. And what we have is in 1981, Seagate introduced the ST506, which was the first five and a quarter uh, hard drive, and uh, it stored five megabytes. And to hook this thing up, what Seagate did is they adapted a floppy disk type interface. And so if you ever have taken apart a machine and you notice the hard drive has these has two cables and generally it goes on to two edge connectors, it's an ST506 drive. And the, uh, the wide connector is the control, uh, control signals from the disk controller, and that's an important point. And then the smaller cable actually is the data. So you'll notice I said going back to the disk controller. These drives are not intelligent. Uh, the, the board on the bottom of the disk is keeping sure that the disk spins at the correct RPM, telling the controller that, yes, I'm ready to write, mo physically moving the head around, doing some amplification. But there's no. There's no intelligence, there's no error correcting, and there's no formatting in the disk itself. So if you get one of these drives and it's not paired with the controller card that it was originally hooked up with, if you just take it and hook it up to another controller, the drive isn't going to work. You're going to need to format it. Um, we also saw a few years later, there was an interface called ESDI that was used in a lot of higher end systems. It arrangement, but it, uh, in those drives, there was some intelligence on the disk. And when they were new, that made the disks a lot more reliable. It made them faster. It made them easier to set up and you can move them between systems. But today, that actually poses a number of very serious challenges keeping the old disks going. So, uh, I get a lot of emails asking me about that. Uh, bus attachment disks, and um, the biggest one they made was, a, was either 120 or 160 megabytes. Um, hmm? I think they were PS2 drives. Yeah, yeah, these were used in the IBM PS2. Because again, now we're into that kind of late 80s, early 90s time frame. So yeah, these were used quite a bit in the IBM PS2, and in some systems, now because the, the controller is actually on the drive, um, the reason they call them direct bus attachment is that the connector just is essentially hooking the drive onto the microchannel bus. It's not a host adapter. The control signals that are going over this aren't like the, the actual magnetic transitions that you'd be getting over the cables on an ST506 drive. That's similar to ATA? Yes, similar to ATA uh, in, in concept. Um, now, unfortunately, I don't have any sound. So, the, uh, in a lot of the early drives, too, of course, you've got a, a head sitting on the disk, and you have to move the head around. And what a lot of early drives like this used was a stepper motor. And so that is a, it's a physical device, and you can move it a certain number of steps or clicks. 
So when you turn one of these drives on, you'll, um, you'll hear it. Is that going to play? Well, you, when they start, you can hear them. The, the head will begin to move, and you'll hear it going bang, 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 bang against the cabinet of the drive. And it's using that mechanical end stop to know where the head is. And then as the drive is operating, it just counts. OK, I've moved four clicks from here. I've moved five clicks from here. And this is not, that's unfortunate. PowerPoint does not want to cooperate with me. Um, and so all of these drives, when you would go to set them up, these original drives, you would need to low-level format them. And that's a term that gets misused a lot, because you'll hear, oh, you know, I got my new hard drive, I went into DOS, and I low-level formatted it. Well, that's not, that's not what you did. So how is the data actually stored on the disk? So on your disk platter, you have a track or a cylinder, because it's a round cylinder. And then in that cylinder, we take it and divide it up into a number of sectors. And so a, the data is stored in a particular sector, on a particular track, on a particular disk uh, surface or head. And a drive might have you know, multiple platters, multiple heads. So let's look at a track and just stretch it out so that it's a little easier to see. And now we have are sectors. So what's inside of a sector? So there are a number of data fields inside of the sector on a hard disk. So way at the beginning, there's going to be a header that tells the drive, OK, this is the beginning of this sector. It's a good sector. Excuse me, information that tells the controller this is, a, this is what sector this is. This is a good sector. And then another field that says, OK, the data is about to start. And then this field that contains your data. Now, if you're in, in your operating system and you go in and, OK, now I'm going to do my disk format, all you're changing is the stuff inside this field. You're not touching the first two fields. There might be some error correcting code that gets generated by the disk controller. DOS isn't touching that, but the controller handles it. And then you might have some servo information that the controller reads to help it know where the heads are. Um, now, if you were at the first talk in this room, you know that nothing is forever. And over time, magnetically, this information will just start to fade on the disk and get weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. And what, hap what can happen on a lot of the drives that are newer than the early ST506s, some of these very early disks, the servo information fades away. The controller doesn't have it anymore. And now it doesn't know where the head is on the disk. And the challenge is, how do you recreate this? And unfortunately, the answer in a lot of cases is you can't. It is not possible to recreate the servo information. So once the drive stops working, it could be fine electrically and fine mechanically. But as of today, it's dead. There's, there's, there, unfortunately, there is nothing you can do. Um, and these fields do get established when you low-level format a drive. Um, so as I said, you know, there, you've got your servo thing, if that goes away, it, the, the, he, it, the drive doesn't know where the head is anymore, so it can't find the cylinder, it can't find the, uh, the sector, and you can't just flip it from broken to fixed. Um, so what I wanted to do now is kind of show you, uh, has, has anyone here taken apart hard drives before? Okay, well I guess I'm playing to, to the audience. So. What I wanted to do, yeah, so 
one thing that you have to be careful of in a hard drive is the head is, doesn't actually touch the disk while the drive is running. The, the disk spinning around creates a, a, a rush of air that pushes the head off the disk very slightly. And if you get a piece of dust or lint or anything else, lint is pretty big compared to that gap, and it'll get in there, and then the head will hit it, and you'll get, you'll hear this little ping sound as the drive is running, and that is the sound of a bad sector being created. So, uh, what? Don't try this at home if it's a drive that you that you care about. Uh, this is one that I have previously disassembled. And it has a number of, uh, of faults in it, which I'll be able to use to show you what can go wrong. And maybe you can fix it, and maybe you can't. So let's do this. So, that's not, that's not me. So, it, this is a um, ST277 Seagate drive, and you can see it's got three, three platters. And so if you're ever taking one of these apart. One thing that I always wonder is how do they, how are the platters actually held in the drive? Well, you can see there's this plate on top with a single screw. And it's all just a friction fit. We take this screw out. There's a, a cap. And then the platters just sit on there, all just from friction. And then there's a spacer. These might still be usable, so I kind of want to not completely destroy them. And then a platter, and then a spacer, and then another platter. Now you'll notice there were no heads in this drive, and that's because I didn't want to deal with taking them off the disk surface right now in this presentation, but we will do that on this Lisa drive. And so now we're left with the, uh, the spindle motor. And that is also becoming a real problem for a lot of these drives, is that the bearings go bad, and you'll get grinding. And something I've seen with a drive that hasn't run in a long time, you go to fire it up, and you can hear it's, it's chugging, and it's trying to go. And then there will be a pop where the driver circuit for this motor explodes because the motor has got so much drag in it that it overloads the, uh, the, the, the motor driver and, and pops the chip. So this one isn't as bad as some that I've seen, but it's not great. And one of the things I had hoped to do before this presentation was investigate can you get one of these things apart and replace the bearings? Because it's like, well, it's just a bearing. You should be able to take it apart. And the problem that I ran into is that a lot of this is pressed together. Like when they assembled it, they must have had some kind of jig, pushed it together. The height of this is critically important, because if you take it apart and then put it back together and it's wrong, then all the platters are going to be in the wrong spot. And so the heads are going to be, when, it, when the disc, so you might have heard of uh, head parking. And the, what you do is on, that, on the disc, there's a uh, cylinder that has no data on it. So whenever the drive gets turned off, it moves the heads to this parking cylinder. The drive spins down, it coasts down, and the heads just touch the disc. And that's OK. And then when you, this turns back on, they'll touch for a little bit, comes up, they lift off. Um, well, if you had the platter height wrong, those heads are going to be on a slight angle, which then instead of gliding over the disc are going to be like digging into it with a corner of the ceramic head. So that just wouldn't work. Um, so 
I did try and soak this with, uh, with some penetrating oil, but I think one of the problems is there's a bearing near the top and you just can't get at it. So I don't have good news for uh, these, these small Seagate uh, motors. Now this disc was made, when was it made? I think like 1988, something like that. So this is a little bit later, but it does have a stepper motor. So if I move it, it's probably hard to see, but it actually, Seagate used pretty nice stepper motors in their drives. So it does move little, there's definable clicks to this. And this drive, on the other hand, is not carefully made. This is a um, this is a mini scribe disc and if you've ever uh, had an old uh, old Macintosh you might have heard one of these things grown to life. Um, and you'll notice the stepper has this optical interrupter on it and the thing has to spin around like twice to move the head all the way across the disc. So it ends up being very slow. Um, this is, I've got set up to do a, a butterfly seek, so it should start here in a moment. So the nice thing about a disc like this is that you can low level format it. Because the stepper motor has a physical place it needs to be in in each time and it can count, you can recreate all those fields on this type of disc. However, on a disc like this, which is really one of the very first IDE hard drives, this is a plus hard card 20, this doesn't use a stepper motor. It uses a voice coil servo, which is actually what this uh, Apple drive uses as well. Those have no physical spots. It's just an arm on a, on a bearing. Now, well, so what a lot of those drives do when they, sit, when they format them at the factory, they had a jig that they would put the disc in, and then they use a laser micrometer to measure the position of the disc head and use different equipment to write down the servo tracks. Obviously, we don't have that software, we don't have the jig, and we don't have the micrometer anymore. Um, additionally, some drives, instead of, um, instead of just having servo um, information in each sector, would have an entire uh, platter that was just servo information. So you might see a drive listed as having seven heads. How, how is that possible? Well, that's because it was a very expensive drive, it's very fast, and it dedicates an entire disk surface to that servo information. So when it was new, it was fantastic, but now that's a big liability because when that servo information fades, the drive is going to stop working. Um, so one way that we, at least with these Apple drives, which, have a, which do have a voice coil servo, Here, let's put the uh, rock grinder aside. And this is actually technology that Quantum later used. This, this hard card has this same tech in it, but there, as far as I'm aware, there is no way to low-level format the drive. Um, if you see here, Do you see this device here on the side? That's a, uh, a graticule. It's a piece of glass with a bunch of etched lines in it. And then right here is an LED. And so as the head moves, it can um, count the, the pulses and get, get a rough idea of where the, uh, the head is on the disk. And then it uses the uh, servo information that's written during the level format to get the exact position. So on these drives, it can use this 
uh, Graticule to get a rough position, count the ticks, and, do, and restore the disk. Um, so let's take this disk apart. Um, I don't have my precision disk head removal tool, which is a bent paper clip. Um, when you're taking a drive apart, you don't want the heads to touch each other. Um, I was not able to locate the exact reasoning behind it, but it, from what I could see, you don't, you don't want the heads to ever touch each other on the disk. You want to hold them apart. Additionally, um, when, the, uh, when you move the heads off the disk, if you get them off the disk and then slide the head arm out of the way, then when you go to put it back together, you can just move it back in. You don't have to worry about the heads scratching against the disk. Although with this drive, that's not a concern. Um, so I'm just going to do that. Um, so again, like the uh, Seagate drive, there's a clamping piece. There were three, I only put two back in. Yep, this lifts off. This comes out. Now I'd like you to notice something that's kind of nice. So, hypothetically, I could fix this drive because this is what the back side of the platter looks like. Oops. Where have my bits gone? They've turned into dust and been collected by the, uh, there's a filter inside of these drives that um, helps to keep the disk clean. Uh, you can see it down here. No, maybe you can't because it's too dark. There's a filter. There, that exists too. There's another, there's another pressure regulator uh, thing, but this, inside of the disk, the, like you can see it on this mini scribe drive as well. You can see the filter right here. And so as the air is being pushed around by the disk platters, it gets pushed through the filter. So any incidental junk that gets in there is hypothetically collected before it crashes a, uh, a disk head. So let's take the motor out of this guy. And this will kind of show you. I have a good story for you on that. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Let me get this out of here real quick. So this actually is going to show another problem that this particular drive has. You heard me mention it has a servo, so it should be free floating. Notice how if I bump the, this, it kind of moves back to where it was and it's got some notches in it, that's because the grease in the bearings is all turned to goo, and it's kind of gooping back into the place where it wants to be. This drive wouldn't work because the servo doesn't have enough torque to overcome that, that, um, that grease. And I've seen that on these mini scribe drives as well, where um, when the motor is doing small seeks, it'll work, but then when it goes to do a big seek, you'll hear this kind of like bearing screeching sound and the head gets stuck. Now on these, you can generally drip a little bit of three-in-one oil externally on the, um, on the stepper motor and it will free it up. Uh, on an ST506, I did actually have to take the drive apart and put a drop on the inside of the, of the stepper, inside the drive, because it was the, the, the bearing was just too gummy. Um, so let's take this guy out. So this is a, a nice visual comparison of uh, 15 years, 10 years of, of disk progress. And this, when I, when I got this disk, it, it wouldn't even spin. Um, it's much better now. I, I, uh, I had dripped, after taking it apart, I could get into this little tiny gap, and I was able to get a little bit of oil into that bearing. So this 
This now spins, whereas it didn't spin before, but it's still not usable because it, it can you, I don't know if the high, the, the scratchy sound's coming across. It, it might work, but I don't think it would work for very long. Um, additionally, I was like, oh, maybe I can use a puller and get this top piece off and then I can, you know, get at the bearing, maybe what, whatever else is in there. And then I took a flat edge and the top of the, sp of the, the shaft from the motor is slightly below the top of this mounting piece. So there's no way I could really reliably press this back together and get the disc height uh, correct. It would be a little bit off and then it would self-destruct the first time I turned it on. So um, I was hoping to have some better news for this presentation, but uh, kind of dire. Um, let's see, what else haven't I uh, babbled about? Yeah. Yes. This. Yeah. Um, if I was trying to revive this drive, I would think on these I have been able to put a little drop of oil on the on the bottom. And a little drop. I've not yet tried to put a drop on the inside. I haven't needed to because these discs are kind of uncommon. But I feel like that would get this going again um, from that standpoint. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that I, if these were drives that I actually cared about, I wouldn't be taking them apart in front of you right now because it, although this is a pretty clean space, there's still like dust from my hands and all this dust everywhere. Uh, when these were built, they were made in clean rooms that were very expensive um, and very good. And I wondered, oh yeah, yeah, here's my, my precision um, disc, disc uh, re head removal tool, um, which actually works pretty good. Um, you just have to be careful not to gouge the disc with the paper clip. Uh, I built myself a mini clean room. So this cost me about 50 bucks. I've got a HEPA air filter, a air conditioner exhaust hose from like a portable AC unit. I built this out of coroplast and gaffer tape and then there's a piece of, of uh, Lexan sitting on the top. And what I ended up doing, I just cut two holes in it for me to stick my hands in. And then keeping this whole thing pressurized, like any dust that was on my hands or whatnot, would just get blown out of the enclosure. And I actually swapped. This, is, this motor is not the original one from this disc. This had a good motor on it. And I disassembled both drives inside the, the clean chamber, switched, switched the parts around. And I found when I started that one up, I didn't get that little ping, ping, ping sound of the dust particles impacting the head like I have on other drives I've taken apart. So it's certainly not perfect, but with a little bit of effort, you can make yourself a clean-ish room uh, to do some disc surgery. And I, I would highly recommend that. Uh, on that same drive, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the one with the glass scale, was that considered to be more, a more expensive drive because of the dimensional glass scale? Of the this is a pretty... This is a pretty early voice coil hard drive. I, I was trying to find, so, so Apple got a big case of not invented here syndrome in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. This disc was actually manufactured by Apple. Um, it's one of two hard drives their disc division made and I think only the only one that actually shipped. Um, so, and I think, Someone will probably correct me, but I think this is like the first time a more personal type computer had a five and a quarter drive with a voice coil actuator. Because um, this was released in, this was on the market in 1984 and they were developing it from like 1982. Um, so yeah, I think this was definitely a higher end drive. They were trying for more performance. It didn't work out that way. A 10 megabyte ST406, 412 is actually a little bit faster, but I think this has a little bit better error correction. Um, this actually, in the original 
mounting, it has, it has like a card cage and it's got an intelligent controller and a servo controller and an internal serial bus and all this stuff to try and make it very reliable. Um, so one other thing I wanted to show was, if I could find my cursor, was this note from Seagate this is from like their, their information, and one of the things that was interesting, if we scroll down to ATA, AT attachment drives, so again, this is IBM AT 286. Um, there is no, the, the card that's stuck in your ISA slot is not a disk controller, it's, an, it's a host adapter. The controller is built into the disk, and so, this got smaller when I dr drug it up here. I'm a little annoyed. In bold text, it says, do not low-level format Seagate AT interface drives. This will destroy the drive. Um, this thing in my hand is actually a, a, a ST506 to SCSI adapter. A lot of uh, some of the early SCSI devices you get with, say, the external drive for your Mac Plus, SCSI disks weren't quite on the market yet. They were really expensive. So you could just take your 36 pin and your, what are these, 20 pin control cables to your uh, uh, ST506 drive, hook them to this, and it spits SCSI out on the other end. Um, it wasn't until a few years later that the uh, SCSI intelligence actually got moved onto the drive. And so this is actually, this is a, the disk controller. It is controlling the, low-level magnetic stuff going onto the disk. Um, now this is, this is a SCSI disk as well. This one you can low-level format. Some SCSI disks you can low-level format. But anything with a, with a servo platter or pretty much anything that's voice call, you're not going to be able to. So I guess fortunately now there's a, a number of uh, solid state options you can get that uh, replace a SCSI disk with a SD card or CF card or something like that. Um, so you can keep the machines going, but unfortunately keeping that nice uh, rocks in a uh, blender sound going is not always possible. Yeah? Did you ever <laughs> encounter or maybe have any suggestions of how things do with what they used to call stiction? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So thank you. I actually wanted to mention that. So. When the disk is off, so um, we asked about uh, stiction, which is uh, taking the words uh, friction and stickiness and putting them together. When you shut the drive off, you know, the, head, heads, the drive spins down and the head lands on the disk. Um, I think there is a very, very light lubricating oil on the surface of the disk so that that touchdown is very gentle. Um, Oil gets gummy after 20 years, and what will happen is the motor in the drive won't have enough torque to kind of break that sticky bond. And that's actually a real problem with these plus hard cards. It's a problem with these mini scribe drives. Um, so you go to turn it on and just nothing happens. Uh, with these drives, it's actually pretty easy to free them up. You grasp the drive like this and just twist it real quick because you've got more torque in your wrist than the little motor in the drive has. Um, on these mini scribe drives, if you don't want to unmount it and you're just being lazy, you can just poke at the little interpreter on the side. Probably not the best idea because you're now moving the... Oh, so that's another important thing. These drives don't auto park. A lot of these early stepper motor drives don't auto park. So whenever you turn the disk off, you know, that's where the head lands. Oops, it was in the middle of your data. And now you do that 10 times and you've worn the, worn the surface off the disk. Um, these Seagate drives, when you turn them off, they developed a system where the mass of the rotating disk takes the motor and turns it into a generator and drives the head stepper off the disk. So whenever you turn one of these off, you'll hear, you'll start to spin down and then this knocking sound 
That's, that is actually the disc banging into its end mechanical stop, but it is in the, uh, the landing zone, they call it, the parking cylinder. So that, um, that, that makes the drives last a lot longer, especially if it's in uh, something that you're going to be moving it around. Uh, pretty Yes, there, you can, there are utilities that allow you to, to park the drive um, many, many. Um, I, I'm pretty sure any PC voice coil drive that you're going to encounter is automatic parking. I don't, I don't think there were any that, that didn't, but I, I could be wrong. Yep. Is So the, qu the, the topic was brought up of my drive doesn't work. What can I do without taking it apart to get it going again? And putting the drive in a plastic bag and then putting it in the freezer and letting it get thoroughly cold can sometimes get it to work again temporarily. Um, I've used that on old drives and I've used it on new drives actually. That, that technique does still work. You have to be careful of moisture obviously, because no, it's, especially, I'm from Virginia, so it's, you know, we're right near D.C., so obviously it's a swamp, and, um, you know, you don't want all this condensation on the, on the disc. That's not good for it. Um, someone earlier mentioned the, uh, that the drive needs to breathe, so on this plus hard card, it's pretty, oh, wait, it's, uh, you can see it on the top here. See those four little holes? Uh, there's a, there will be a little breather thing that allows us to expand and contract just with barometric pressure changes. Um, on some drives, you'll see a, a little warning that says, do not cover. Be yeah. Yep. Yeah, there will be a, I think, yeah, I, think, I don't know if there's one under here. Actually, yeah, that's interesting. You can see, yeah, that, I've, already, I've already had this apart. You can actually see the little dust marks where after 30 years of breathing in and out. Now, unfortunately, this drive doesn't work. Um, I wish it did. The, um, these hard cards, oh, that's, that reminds me of one other thing I want to say. It's like I should be looking at my presentation notes or something. Um, okay, so another thing to bear in mind with these old hard drives is the kinds of things you learn with old computer repair in general. And a lot of these old disks have socketed chips. They have EPROMs that, or uh, yeah, EPROMs that forget their bits. Uh, this is the, one of the controller chips off of one of these Lisa widget disks. And you can see all these pins. They're not very shiny. They're actually pretty much black. And on multiple occasions, I found where the the, the chip you look at it, and you're like, oh, it looks fine. I don't want to. I don't want to risk breaking the socket or anything. And then you pull it out and the pins are totally black. So um, if you have any device with socketed chips and it's acting weird, my first suggestion is always, I, I like to just pull the chips completely. Some people like to just pop them up and seat them back down again. I prefer to take them out, back support the pins, use a wire brush, and really get them clean. Um, because I've had too, too, many, uh, too many things that act intermittently, and that's, I, I hate refixing things, so. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, can you go over <laughs> how to identify an SD506 interface from an ESDI interface? So, so yeah, so SD506 versus ESDI, same cables, completely different interface. Um, if you've got an IBM PS2 system with the two cables in it, it's ESDI. Pretty much, it's going to be ESDI. Um, the other thing I would suggest is um, use the Google machine, plug in the model number of the hard drive that's in there, and it'll tell you all about it. Um, in general, from what I saw, it seemed like the ESDI disk controllers, you know, they will say somewhere on the, con or on the excuse me, the host adapter card will say ESDI on it somewhere and they generally had fewer chips than the old ST506 cards, but that's not a hard and fast rule. I'm doing a mix and match, so I've got to be able to marry up an ESDI with a, a drive yeah. with an ESDI card that I think is an ESDI card, mm. but it may be an ST506 card. Yeah, yeah. The yeah, the problem is knowing, well, you know, what do I have, and... Most of the model number of the card 
Yeah, look up the model numbers of the cards, and if you can't find that, find some of the bigger chips and see if you can find a data sheet on them. Maybe there's something that's like, oh, this is a dedicated ESDI controller or something. Yeah. Eric. Um, so the thing to watch out for, like with those IBM direct bus attachment drives, the power is on that edge connector. So you want to not just shove something in there because it fits. From my understanding on ESDI and ST506, it's all, there's, no, there's no power transmission over those ribbon cables. It's all um, logic level signaling. So my understanding is it just won't work. That said, I wouldn't try it with something that you consider important. Yeah. Uh, back in the days, uh, ST225, mm -hmm. I guess they had some chip on, uh, on the board that uh, tend to overheat and, uh, and fail. Okay. Uh, so uh, if we just replace the chip, should that be, uh, should be okay? Or so the, the question is. In the process, that it actually do some damage to the. Uh, on an ST, you said 205? 225, there's a chip that overheats and fails. Do, do you know what the chip does? Well, I don't know. I, I, I knew that it was uh, pretty common back in the days that you had to watch out for the, for the device and to mount it according to it so the flow, airflow was mm. uh, correct. Something gets hot. I mean, I would say that might be the, uh, the drive, maybe it, it's a driver chip, like the driver for the, 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 uh, the head, head stepper or something. I'm not immediately familiar with that. Um, oh, one other thing I wanted to point out. You know, I'd always seen these old drives like this with the, with the little flag on them. And then I'd seen these Seagate drives, the newer ones, and like, oh, they don't have a little optical encoder anymore. I wonder how they are counting the steps. There is an optical encoder. It's built into this black plastic bit. So I have heard of these drives where the LEDs, the little infrared LED gets weak. Uh, especially in these mini scribes, and then it can't find track zero anymore. It'll just keep banging into the stop over and over again. And I think someone figured it out by using a, uh, like a security camera that didn't have an infrared cut filter on it, and they could see the disc, like, oh, the, the infrared light's not working anymore, replace the LED, and the drive worked again. Um, something else that is, okay, enough, uh, enough of that. Um, something else that, uh, you can do on these, let's say track zero is gone bad, track zero has a bad sector right where the um, fat table is or something. You can cheat and move this little encoder forward or back just a little bit and then re-low level format and that will move where track zero physically is on the disk and you might be able to use it again. Yeah. I think I noticed on the side of your Seagate drive -in. Did you want to address run length limits? Yes. Um, I can, yeah. So the early drives are um, MFM encoded. And this drive was um, RLL encoded, which allowed it to get, is it like 15 or 25? 50% 50 50 more. It's quite a bit more data. But the drive was the same, I guess. Well, the, the, they were made on the same line from the same parts. In factories, they do like batch quality test check. quality checking. So the really extra shiny drives get the little R on the end of them. Yeah. And then the ones, the ones that, that work, they work pretty good. Those became the regular drives. So um, what I read about some people doing where they were really concerned about reliability, they would get the RLL certified drive and then use it on an ST506 controller. Now you've got the really good drive and you're not working it very hard. Because what, what that's doing, you know, the, we had the cylinder with all the, the, the sectors in it. To store more data, you're just putting more sectors in that same space so the bits all get closer together. So the mechanical tolerances of the drive become very important. So like this drive, if you, if, depending on what angle you have it sitting on when it's doing that butterfly seek, you can actually hear it kind of knocking around a little bit. 
not a very precise drive, if this was a, not a SCSI drive, but if you tried to format it in that higher density, it probably wouldn't work. And as I understand it, RLL got a bad rap when it was introduced because a lot of people were like, oh, I can do this and get 50% more storage on my same hardware. And it would work for like a week or a month and then suddenly all your data is gone because the drive's mechanical tolerances just aren't, they aren't up to the task. Um, so that's really the difference. And you can plug either drive into either controller, vice versa. It's, it's, it's because the, the controller is just sending the, bit, the electrical transitions at a faster rate. Um, I, you know, that might be the case for some of the, the later ones, but, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's the same thing. It's all, all binning. That's, that was the word I was looking for. It's binning. For the, for the R drive, you put the best platters and the best head and the best circuit board, and then the ones that, yeah, they're, they're okay. Those went into the standard drive, so. Because is more sensitive to bit Yes, yeah. Uh, Ian. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I've never personally experienced that, but I've heard about, um, it, yeah. Um, Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. The question on the ST506 is where mm -hmm. you don't have or don't know what the matching controller is. Are you aware of anything that will help one recover the data? Yes. Dave Gesswine has developed a, uh, I think it's FPGA based, uh, a system that will. Yeah, yeah, it'll read all the magnetic transitions off the disk. Um, I would, I would talk to him about that, because he's got the thing that'll let you capture the disk. He's got a thing that'll let you emulate the disk. What's the name again? Dave, David Gesswein. He's, he, he's, he's exhibiting here. He's um, oh, wow. in, in fact, yeah, it, if you actually wanted to do any really serious talk about hard drives, ask him, not me, because I'm just babbling stuff I read on Wikipedia. I guess one, one thing I glossed over really quickly here. This, on the controller card, there's, you know, so a computer has its memory space, right? And the ROM on the controller card lives in the memory space. You can do this debug command, and that's telling it to execute memory at that location. These, a lot of the controllers had a low-level formatting routine built into the ROM. Of the, of the card, and you would execute it by doing, doing a debug and then that memory address. Interestingly, on this plus card, when you do that, it tells you, hey, you're, you can't low-level format this. It just gives you a, they put a program in that location to tell you, you can't do this. <laughs> I think it was common, like, when Norton used to leave and stuff and give you a button to navigate it via built-in state. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> what in that same vein with a lot of modern day APAs is still the same clock size. It's stuff's going to fade and fail. Mm -hmm. Is there any recourse of getting down to low level formatting of that you don't have no. Yeah. no, well no, I know it's not possible. So it's it's the same deal where so if you ever 
I should have brought a, a quantum. Does everyone remember a quantum Bigfoot drive, the, the last five and a quarter drives? If you look on the bottom of those, you'll, or no, excuse me, on the side, you'll see there's a little clear sticker. And is, if you turn the drive on, you'll be able to see the head in there. And that's the window that the laser micrometer fired through to measure the position of the head while the whole disc was clamped in, this, in a jig. So we don't have the jig, we don't have the software, we don't have the micrometer. I mean, hypothetically, it would be possible if you could get that stuff, but I did, I'm guessing it all got thrown out 20, 30 years ago. So it, it's unfortunately, there's a lot of stuff we're able to fix as hobbyists, but that, I, I don't know of a way to recreate it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Sometimes the, the the software isn't in the ROM anymore. Actually, with the Apple Profile drives, the regular ROM, it there's a there's a formatting ROM you plop in and a regular running ROM, and you have to switch it out when you want to do a level format. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would, I would, I would think that a lot. So that that text file I showed earlier, I actually can't remember now if I grabbed that from Seagate's FTP site or if it came from a mirror that was someplace. Um, I think a lot of the the Seagate stuff, I think a lot of the Connor stuff is is in Internet Archive. It's it's around if you Google for it. Um, for and even I have a. Uh, Microscience branded drive that um, doesn't work, of course. But I was able to find the um, the, the data sheets for it, and that's a uh, that's a that is a, a, a servo drive. And when that one turns on, it spins up the disc, and then you hear the servo slam into the disc brake or the head brake. It releases the disc brake, slams the head into the end of the like its mechanical end stop, reparks it, and turns the disc off. And the only thing I can think of is, oh, it's just not reading anything from the disk. So it's like, where, where am I? Where do I go? Because the, the servo, a servo, so the, the stepper motor has one level of movement that it has. It can just move in steps. A servo is, is variable. So it'll actually speed up and slow down as it moves across the disk surface. So it's like, oh, nothing's here. Full speed ahead. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Oops, I, I hit the edge of the drive. So. Um, yeah, a lot of times they yeah. sometimes the signal itself is constant, it doesn't do that on some of the bigger drives. Mm -hmm. But what, if you don't see servo data, that kind of servo across your system, you yeah. have no idea. What yeah, if, if, yeah, if it can't. If it, it can't. could be servo, it could be servo data, it could be the head thing. Yeah, yeah, it could be a bad head, could be a bad amplifier, could be a bad connection, could be a bad op amp. Could be many bad things. And unfortunately, it's anything in that chain, if it stops, the, the drive doesn't work anymore. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, one other thing, this is actually the first time I had seen this failure um, in this drive originally. So you can't see it in this one. Um, wrap, the, the way that the stepper actually drives the, the head is there's like the curved face of the, of the head and there's a little stainless steel band that's actually wrapped around this spindle. And so as the spindle spins, it, it pull, pushes and pulls that stainless steel band so that there's no slop in it. It's not like it's gears or something. The stainless steel band on this drive was actually broken. Um, so you, you, I mean, it hadn't gotten, it hadn't like fallen and gotten into the disc or screwed it up or anything. But David said, oh yeah, I, I, you know, I imaged this disc. I don't need it anymore. Well, I think he got the same thing over and over and over again because the head wasn't actually moving. I think you could actually fix that in this. You could take a new piece, get a little, a little strip of something and drill a little hole in it and tension it and probably and reload level format the drive. Um, I guess one other thing to mention is that in newer drives, I have seen people swap heads, swap platters and things like that. You saw how the heads, the platters, they're not 
indexed in any way. They're just stuck in there and clamped in place. And so there's actually a device that it kind of looks like a coffee can that goes around the platters and clamps them in place to keep their orientation the same. So you take them out as a unit and put them in as a unit. Because if you rotate one, you know, now it's not going to work anymore. Um, with the single platter drives, obviously that's not a big deal, but um, anytime I, if I had the ability to low level format a drive, A, if it's one I wanted to use in one of my pieces of vintage equipment, I would just do it because you want to refresh all of those, those uh, transitions on the disk. And I would also low level format anytime I had like replaced any part of the drive, even if it worked. You know, if you're doing data recovery, sure, get your stuff off. But if you want to actually use the thing, uh, low level format it because it's probably going to, the, it might be within tolerance now, but then it's going to get out and then it's not going to work. And it's going to be the day before VCF and suddenly your exhibit doesn't work. So, I think I'm. You have experience in that. Well, yeah. 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 I think last question. So the question is kind of lubricant. Um, you want to use a very light oil, like a sewing machine oil. Um, no, nope. Gluc oil. Hmm? Gluc clock, clock oil. Oh, clock oil. Pen pendulum clocks. Yeah, yeah, because that has to be very, very light oil. Yeah, um, it needs. Yeah, because it, because I mean. I just used, so zoom spout oil is, um, is not a synthetic oil. It's just a, it's a natural oil. And it does turn gummy over time. And obviously, any, I like to say that the, the, the term minor surgery is an oxymoron. You know, like personal surgery. Same thing on a hard drive. You know, anytime you take it apart, that could be it. So you don't want to, like, use crappy lubricant on a drive and be like, great, it works, that's good enough. And then in five or 10 years, oops, I need to do it again. Oops, now it's broken. So yeah, use a synthetic lubricant. Um, one thing that I didn't get a chance to test, um, I had a ST506 that had a, it, I, I do a lot of stuff with cars too, and the noises that were coming from this bearing were like, if I heard that coming from my car, it would be like, turn it off before it like ejects pieces on the highway. It was so bad. Um, and I, it, it was arranged a lot like this, where there was the big external magnet, the driver board underneath of it, and then bearings on the inside. And I used some uh, Schaefer's Penetrol, which is a, a synthetic penetrating lubricant I've used for, for a lot of things. And I filled, there's like a, a lip around the bottom of this, and I filled it with the penetrol, hoping it would like soak in, but not that there would be so much that it flows through the bearing, goes into the drive, and gets all over the platters, because that would ruin it too. Um, and it didn't really work. Like it just, it didn't change the, the noise at all. So I also found, like for this motor, is made by a company called STC in Japan. They're still around. I looked them up. And they have this nice FAQ on their website saying, oh, can you provide data sheets or specifications for any of the motors for your drives? And the answer is no, because they're proprietary with the people who requested, who had the drive designed in the first place. So um, again, kind of, kind of anticlimactic in that here's this mechanical thing. It's made of metal. It's in my hand. It's not that big, but I can't take it apart, so I can't fix it. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of those miniature bearings have dust seals either side. So yeah, there's dust yeah, dust seals. Yeah, it's it's and they're 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 sealed because you saw, you know, the it just bolts into the into the case here. It's not like it's it's sealed from the underside. So that needs to be airtight to prevent dust getting in. So it's a sealed what I would assume maybe it's a roller bearing, maybe it's a ball bearing, but um you know, it, something I, I've done with uh, clocks before, little, the little G clocks, is you get the little capsule and you heat it up to drive the air out, and then you let it cool off, and it sucks the oil in. Maybe you could do that with one of these, but I don't know. I, 
you'd still be taking, taking the whole, whole thing apart. That's actually an int I hadn't thought about trying that before. I might try that. And actually, if anyone in this room has a dead ST506, I would love to do some experiments on it. I have a very odd problem. All my ST506s work. <laughs> so I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to take one apart. Everyone threw away all their broken ones 10 years ago. So, um, you know, there's only so many of them left. I don't want to destroy a good one for science, even if it's got a bad motor. I, the two that I've got with the worst sounding motors had no defects from the factory and still have no defects. And I have to think all that, if I kept running them, all that vibration is not, can't be good, so. Yeah. Um. There's, yeah, the, so on some of these. So the the point was, so there can be like a whining or a screaming noise. Spinning things make static electricity. So this little, this little dimple on the bottom of the motor, when it's installed in the, in the mechanism, has a little, little finger that reaches out and a little carbon pad that touches it, just barely touches it as a static ground and can get worn down or a little wonky and make a lot of noise. And you can just shift it or bend it a little bit so it's on a, touching on a new spot on the carbon. And I've read that it will quiet the drive sound. I've never had that work on any of my ST506s, but. It, it, it's worked on some of the later Oh yeah, or you know, yeah, the, the, you always want to try and do process of elimination, right? So if you think maybe it's the, the, the grounding thing that's making the noise, sometimes it's on a screw, just take the whole arm off, that'll let you know, okay, great, then I bolt it down in a different spot. But I think that's about all the time we had. Thanks for listening to me, uh, me babble up here.